Okay. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, dialogue session. Uh, we have uh, three panelists uh, here uh, to, to join us. So we have, uh, as uh, noted by Sonia in the introduction, we have uh, Elizabeth Wheaton, currently with the city of Miami Beach, Rod Brown with the Nature Conservancy, and Camilo Trench with the Discovery Bay Center and USBI in, in Jamaica. Um, right now, Camilo, you're, uh, Jennifer Camilo is in the, attend. I think he's in the, he's now not, uh, not in, the, in the attendees. And I, I don't know how that gets moved like that. Okay. So I guess what, what I'd like to do to start with uh, is just to have the, to go around the, the, with the panelists and have them give the brief introduction to myself. I'll start with myself. Um, I'm, I'm, as Sonia mentioned, the chair of the Ocean Sciences Department at the University of Miami. I'm also the director of our wind wave facility here, Sustain, where we do a lot of testing on um, gray green type resilience questions and not really trying to quantify the benefits of these things in a detailed way. And I also do field uh, measurements of physical oceanographic processes. Um, Elizabeth, if you want to start, I see you're to my top in my screen anyway. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Wheaton. I go by Betsy, so you may hear that during the panel. Um, I am the Environment and Sustainability Director with the City of Miami Beach, and my team uh, works on developing green infrastructure projects and works closely with our capital improvements program as well as our public works to bring environmental protection and sustainability into everything that we do as an organization. Great. Uh, Camilo, would you like to go? All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for having me. I am Camilo Trench. I am the lecturer and academic coordinator for the Discover Bay Marine Lab. Uh, we fall under the Center for Marine Sciences, which is under the Department of Life Sciences uh, at the University of the West Indies, Mona campus. So um, apart from being the academic coordinator for the campus where I help to facilitate um, research and different research projects, I also personally study mangrove conservation and restoration. And I've been doing so for a number of years, and I think um, I've been integral in terms of the mangrove rehabilitation revolution that is happening in Jamaica, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I think I might have misidentified your institution in my intro, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, Rod, you, would you like to introduce yourself, please, to avoid any such mistake yeah. on my behalf? Yeah, great. So, uh, Rod Braun, you can see I manage our climate and coastal resilience program. Uh, so really it's kind of like two buckets work. Um, one is really looking at sort of the mitigation and sort of, you know, how do we keep global temps um, from rising, you know, greater than one and a half degrees Celsius. And the other is really strengthening community resilience through the use of nature-based solutions or what we call natural infrastructure. Um, so uh, I think I'll be focusing more on that aspect of the latter of it. And uh, so I'm based in West Palm Beach and uh, prior to working for TNC, I used to work for the water management district in South Florida. Uh, working on Everglades restoration. So I have experience with sort of large scale restoration and uh, estuarine uh, restoration type projects. Great to be here. Thanks, Brian. All right, well, uh, great. And um, I guess the format, uh, Jennifer, if you could help us out here is, can people just send questions into the chat or a Q&A or how are we gonna, well, how's the best way to work this, this session? Uh, people could just enter it into the chat, their questions. Uh, or the Q and A, okay. or I can just let everybody in the room and we can all talk to each other. I can do that too. What do you think? Like this morning? Let's uh, start out like for a little bit with it like this, and then we'll switch. Okay. Kind of more informal. Everybody can just chime in after our first uh, fifteen minutes or so, or first couple little okay. bit. Okay. Uh, no I guess. questions yet. No questions yet. Okay. So, uh, well, well, Rod, uh, let's just start out with you. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, 
nature-based, we, we all understand that nature-based solutions are important for strengthening some of the, strengthening our coastal resilience. And, and what can you tell us about some of the work that you and TNC have been doing on and how the economics of these types of uh, solutions can, can be um, analyzed and brought to bear to rationalize their use? Yeah, good. That's a good question. I, I think that's really important. I think uh, the government is really interested in really kind of what the bottom line is, what that return on investment is in terms of using nature-based type solutions rather than uh, gray infrastructure. And so at TNC, we're really interested and we've done um, quite a bit in terms of analysis of, of really quantifying those benefits, right? And so when we, when we think about the benefits, we're, we're really interested in sort of that flood protection benefit that we can get from those because we know that mangroves and oyster reefs and coral reefs really kind of, you know, knock down wave energy and provide that benefit. And so we've really gone out and quantified those benefits. And we've worked with um, a number of different groups with the USGS uh, to provide those benefits. And we know that, you know, recently there was a USGS study that we worked on uh, jointly that showed there was over um, one and a half billion dollars in flood protection benefits from coral reefs. And it's just in the U.S. alone, right? And so we know that there's, there's really huge benefits um, you think about Hurricane Sandy that went up the coast and, you know, hit New York, New Jersey area, um, areas that had salt marshes intact, right? They had something like 30% savings in terms of avoided losses. So we think it saved something like $625 million in avoided losses, just there alone. Um, and then we looked at a, a study with, uh, after Hurricane Irma, we went on that, and RMS does a lot of the sort of modeling and, and risk modeling work for sort of the really big insurance companies like reinsurance companies as well. So they're very, you know, well established. Um, and we looked at, you know, if we didn't have the mangrove systems in place, what kind of damages would have occurred with, with Hurricane um, Irma? And we found that something like, you know, there would have been an additional one and a half billion dollars in losses, right? So, I mean, that is really significant in terms of the kind of protection, you know, these, these systems provide. So um, investment in them is, I think is really important. And, you know, and to the extent that, you know, they can become a go-to for, for folks as a solution, um, that's what we're really after, you know, not to mention all the sort of environmental services that they provide in terms of power quality, you know, carbon sequestration, all those things. But we think there's serious left in the systems. Great, I, you know, I, I Think that probably for Irma, I would gather that mangoes are probably part of the solution, part of the protective benefits that are obtained, like you see below behind you there. And I was wondering, um, uh, Camilo, you, you work a lot with mangroves. What can be done in a place like Jamaica to uh, prevent uh, mangrove loss or preserve or, or, or expand mangroves? And you know, what has been the, the pro what has been going on there with with mangroves in Jamaica? Okay, thank you, Brian. Jamaica has lost, um, I believe, the figures say about 2,000 hectares of mangroves uh, between like, 1996 and 2006. So we only have about a little less than 10,000 hectares of mangroves. So to keep the remaining mangroves there, um, a lot more needs to be done in terms of conservation. Jamaica, I would say Jamaica is in a conservation and planning stage in terms of um, coastal protection. Even though we have recognized the importance of mangroves and other coastal forests throughout the years, and I can use um, in the background, in my background, you can see a bit of the Kingston Harbor. The Kingston Harbor is the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. And it brings in for our country, um, surprisingly, some years more than tourism. See, and though tourism is our lifeblood, this harbor, it brings in billions of dollars because we are a transshipment port. And this harbor is kept calm by the mangroves and the sand dune systems around it. So we've been looking at the importance of these for quite a number of decades. But now we are looking into um, getting more of these lands under state or government ownership because a lot of the coastal lands, a lot of the mangrove forests are privately owned. So there's a large amount of developmental pressure especially on the north coast of Jamaica. So, you know, when you come to Jamaica and you're enjoying yourself on the north coast, uh, more than likely one of those hotels that you're staying at was a mangrove forest maybe 10, 15 years ago. So there's a lot of competition for mangroves in terms of especially tourism and other infrastructural development because a lot of these mangroves are on white sand beaches. So I think if we continue um, a lot of the policy that we're writing down, a lot of things that we're seeing, 
to conserve these areas and put them into the management of, let's say, the forestry department, then I think we will stand a lot better chance of keeping what is there. And the Jamaica government recently has embarked on planting um, trees, not just mangroves, but trees generally. I think we're looking at something like 3 million trees. But the reality is um, restoring maybe five acres of mangrove forest will give you, um, I'm, close, I'm sure, more than a million mangrove seedlings. So the mangrove forest itself is such an important resource as compared to not downplaying other forest ecosystems, but um, looking at the coastal protective services, mangroves with its maybe estimated about $32 million per year in our flood protection services alone from Jamaican mangroves. So the mangroves um, being in a conservation phase right now by the Jamaica government and respective partners is the important part and the planning has to go hand in hand with that. Very interesting, very interesting this, to, to hear about the the, the conditions going and what your plans are going forward there. Um, Betsy, I, you know, Miami Beach is known as a leader in planning and adaption to sea level rise. Um, how are these green infrastructure solutions being considered in, in the city's resilience plans? Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, Miami Beach is, of course, known as a leader when it comes to adapting to sea level rise. Um, back in 2013, we began a very ambitious uh, stormwater uh, improvement program to raise roads, upgrade stormwater infrastructure to better prepare for climate change. Um, however, what was missing initially was that green piece. And um, we brought in the Urban Land Institute in 2017 to assess our resilience program and, and kind of give it a stress test. What was working, what wasn't working, and how did we need to adjust as we move into the future? And one of the main uh, pieces of feedback that they gave us is that we need to adjust our approach to have um, a greater emphasis on living with water and the incorporation of blue and green infrastructure into our city plans. And that's everything from our capital improvement program. So, you know, how we're thinking about neighborhood projects, um, as well as our park designs um, and our urban spaces. So we've embarked on a journey. We've uh, to figure out how do we do this in, in an urban realm? Um, we retained Jacobs Engineering to uh, look at our stormwater program and help us develop a blue and green infrastructure strategy where we could uh, pick and choose what works in different areas to help be a part of that solution. So it's not going from gray to green 100%, but rather marrying the two. So how do we bring in green infrastructure and incorporate it into our, green inf our gray infrastructure approaches? Uh, we're also looking at the way that we're designing our park spaces. So can uh, green spaces be used to hold and treat and slow water before uh, it is discharged into the bay? Um, I think that this presents a real opportunity. Um, and then finally, of course, our living shorelines. Uh, we have an, a very ambitious program to incorporate living shorelines with different designs. And what we're trying to do is really push that envelope forward as it relates to uh, green infrastructure design. So, you know, can we pull back the seawalls? Can we um, make uh, engineering shifts within um, that uh, benthic, or excuse me, the, the marine edge to uh, bring back mangroves, to look at um, even bringing back seagrasses um, to help uh, be a part of that solution. Uh, interesting. Uh, thank you, Betsy. The, um, there's a, a question. Um, I guess uh, I'd mentioned that we could try to move people in. I, I think that with the number of people we have here, that could work pretty well if you started to do that. By right now, uh, Landolf Road Barbara Egos uh, asked the question, are there any gray green projects you know that integrate mangroves? If not, why not? And what have been the key challenges for their design and implementation? I'm happy to take a uh, stab at this and then if the other panelists want to uh, chime in. Uh, so uh, one of the projects that I'm most excited about is along Indian Creek. Uh, we have 
Um, we're, we're, we have a few, so I could go off on green, gray and green infrastructure projects. I, we have another one that we're working on. I'm actually going to go with that one. We're working on, on Brittany Bay Park, which is also along Indian Creek. We have a great partnership with the Nature Conservancy as well as Next Terra Energy. And what we've done in this location is we've actually, um, the, the seawall was already designed. We were planning to build a seawall that extended the entire length of the park. I saw the plans during review and I was like, wait a minute, this is such a great opportunity. We have this very long linear park. I, I wanna say it's, you know, it's, it's a few thousand feet. Let's bring back the seawall into the park and create habitat waterward of the seawall. So that's exactly what we've done. We've pulled back the seawall. So it's no longer at the water's edge, but rather um, you know, 50 to 100 feet back uh, from that seawall edge. And we're now in the process of revegetating that area with mangroves and other coastal uh, vegetation. Through this project, we're um, also incorporating some out, um, overwater um, overlooks. So as a way to connect uh, the public with these um, green spaces. Because I, I think that's another objective um, with all of our projects is how do we connect the public with the natural environment so that they learn and, and understand and appreciate what is here and, and then also help support future projects that have uh, this nature-based approach. Yeah, maybe I could, I could jump in, Brian. Um, or right if you right Sorry, yeah. Um, so yeah, so we're really excited to be working with Betsy on, on uh, Brittany Bay. I think it's a really innovative project. I think what well, she talked about sort of pulling back that seawall and creating that edge, right? I think it, it's super innovative and it's really inviting for folks to, to see the bay and, and access you know, the, the, the water, which is really critical, I think, for people to become stewards. Um, so we have another project. We're actually working with the city of Miami and on Morningside uh, Park. And so we're looking at a summer, similar thing. And I think that's really critical is to kind of, you know, the combination of these hybrid systems, right? Because I think in a really urbanized sort of, you know, area and estuary, um, you, you can't just have a full green approach in many cases, and you don't want a full gray approach. So really kind of pulling those two together, this hybrid solution really makes a lot of sense. And so we're looking at a very similar thing where we're going to have a, a living shoreline that transitions, you know, potentially into sort of a vegetated berm or some kind of, you know, earthen berm could make a lot of sense to actually reduce sort of, you know, flooding on the park and, and kind of provide that, that protection. So, you know, you can have a variety of, 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 of layered systems where you could do some kind of, you know, uh, rock reef, um, you know, some kind of Spartina, you know, marsh environment, mangroves, and then kind of going to some elevation. Um, to, to really kind of provide that solution. We're currently, you know, in the design concept right now, and hopefully we'll be at 30% design in the next um, couple of months. So it'd be great to kind of, to bring that uh, to the community soon to, for their input and, you know, get that community engagement. And then we have actually a third project we're working on in Palm Beach County. It's called this Resilient Island Project. And there we're, we're really kind of restoring an old remnant mangrove island. Um, and the idea there is to kind of use this layer approach. We're going to be using um, oyster reefs or mangrove pods, um, some marsh grass systems and, and additional mangroves to protect wading bird nesting habitat. Um, the oyster catcher is, is doing quite well up in the area in Palm Beach County. And so we're really one of the ideas if we can kind of protect that wading bird nesting habitat with this layered approach, we think we could apply it to sort of the built environment as well in front of um, sort of, you know, um, seawalls and, and other areas where we could provide that, that layer of protection as well. All right, um, I believe I have something I could add here as well, guys. So the um, Kingston Harbor, which I spoke about earlier, um, along that um, highway, it leads to one of the country's major international airports, the Norman Manley Airport. Now that roadway, um, because of sea level rise and um, some recent storm events, that roadway was continuously being flooded and blocked. So. It's very bad to have an airport being um, flooded and blocked. So um, the government undertook, undertook a large project to, to raise the roadway about three meters high. And they put some rock revetments on the outside. And um, th thankfully, um, sadly, we, um, as many countries do have these challenges, we do not have a lot of engineers who believe in a mixture of gray and green infrastructure. So the engineers were quite happy to have just the rock revetments sitting there looking very ugly, but our environmental agency in NEPA stepped in and insisted that they um, do a little bit of green because the area was originally a mangrove forest. 
um, not a very robust mangrove forest because it's in Kingston. Yeah, that's it. Right. So um, they were mandated to put back some of the mangrove that was um, destroyed during the construction phase. So you can see my background there. Uh, we have some, um, maybe some two-year-old mangroves coming up. And these mangroves were um, replaced, so to speak, um, in front of the, the seawall. Um, so we, the University of the West Indies was contracted to advise them in terms of the slope. Um, and we did the replanting. Um, of course, you know, when it comes to mangrove restoration, um, it's not the greatest idea to just plant plants, but this year was very um, parent limited, meaning that the Kingston Harbor, it doesn't look it right now, but there's a fair amount of solid waste that comes into the harbor. So this solid waste actually has a very um, bad effect on mangrove seedlings. So this, these mangrove forests here, they've been doing well for centuries, but maybe in the last 30 years, they're not sustainable because of the plastic bags and the soda bottles and stuff like that. So when we put in our mangrove seedlings, what we had to do in addition was to fence it. So there, there's actually a, a solid waste fence on the outside of that. And um, it's astounding in terms of the, the response from the public, even though nobody has really um, documented, documented it. But this green space in your background, um, Kingston is the central, central business, district of, business, business district for Jamaica. So essentially, they do a lot of like music videos and people do jogging, et cetera. So this is one of the only green spaces um, along the Palisados Road. So in the afternoon, in the mornings, you have lots of persons jogging along this area. And um, I did a, a count of the amount of um, um, commercials and music videos that I saw them shoot with this mangrove forest that we are restoring in the background. Um, sadly, um, the, the works agency, which is the ultimate agency for construction of um, roadway infrastructure, they weren't so in love with the project. So after the five years ended, they kind of walked away. But we're actually working on another project right now to expand this and to improve upon this because some of the, 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 the marine litter screens have been damaged. And we see where um, the area is very shallow. So if we can find the funding, we'll be expanding this by actually putting in sediment and building more mangrove forests. It will be a nice combination of green and gray infrastructure. And we already know that the public appreciates it. So this is just um, maybe very small compared to a lot of the innovations that you guys are doing in Miami. And believe you me, I've learned a lot of lessons from people like Elizabeth and looking at what the guys are doing in Miami Beach. So um, even though we're not there yet, we're creeping to that sustainability and uh, many agencies have recognized the importance of green and green infrastructure. So I just hope for Jamaica, when we put the seawalls in, it will be mandatory one day to put some green infrastructure with it because we're still putting in sea walls. But is it mandatory to put in the green infrastructure with it? Not 100%, but I hope we'll get there one day. Well, we're certainly still putting in some uh, sea walls here in Miami too. I just drive past one on my way to work or bike past one on my way to work this morning it's going in. Um, Thank you both. Uh, you know, I, when I flash the Google images, the Google Earth images of those two harbors, I mean, you see why immediately these areas are hotspots for for use of these new strategies for coastal protection because of all the the infrastructure, the communities, the people that are directly exposed to the, the threats of sea level rise and and have these these uh, narrow island strips that are ex extremely vulnerable to this. Um, there's a question in the in the um, chat from Julie Topp. Um, I don't know, Julie, if you want to have me read it or if you want to ask, turn off your mic and ask it yourself, you're welcome to do that as well. Now that you're in the... Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. This has been really interesting. I think... Um, what I meant to ask for my question was how different, you know, agencies or governments decide whether, I know we talked about using a mix of both blue, green and gray infrastructure, but are there certain issues where one is better than the other? And are there any like specific reasons why you would go with green, blue versus gray for certain issues? Anybody want to take a crack at that one first? 
Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, that's a great question. I love it because it doesn't really have a fantastic answer. I think, you know, every project is evaluated to see, you know, what potential do we have? We also have budgets. So when we're thinking about how to incorporate blue and green infrastructure into these gray infrastructure projects, a piece of it just starts with the budgeting. How do we make sure that the budget is allowing for that innovative flexibility um, so that we can build that into projects. Um, another um, challenge that we have here on Miami Beach is that we're highly urbanized. So we don't have the space that a lot of municipalities and the counties and countries have to really fully develop that green infrastructure piece. So we have to look for these you know, very targeted approaches. Um, and you know, depending on what the project is, green infrastructure may not be feasible. We have a seawall that, that um, is about to be installed and we wanted to create a project, but it was just too small of a seawall. And for all of the infrastructure there, we only could do gray. However, we have other projects where we have a lot more flexibility. Um, a great example is we have a bioswale project that we're uh, working on for 58th Street. Um, and this is an area that floods. Um, we have uh, tidal flooding that uh, floods the streets uh, during the king tides in the fall. And you know, a heavy rain event occurs and because of the high groundwater table, um, we're seeing flooding in that area. But we do believe that this bioswale approach is gonna help uh, better store and retain water and slow down that speed of the water before it enters the bay. So uh, we were able to get that project partially funded through a grant with FDEP. Um, and that grant is specifically looking at water cleanliness. So um, we've worked with our engineering team and we believe that it's going to have uh, pollution prevention um, elements uh, in the overall design and um, yeah, that, that was the approach there. And, you know, another way that we were able to get that community buy-in is that we're going to also be opening up um, a street end that was um, blocked off from the public. So again, it's looking for these co-benefits, it's evaluating um, the designs and having multiple heads look at the problem. Um, so, you know, we work with our landscape architecture team, our environmental team, our engineers from public works, and it's not a one person decides, okay, this is what we're doing, but rather a team approach, what works, what, what doesn't work, and evaluate um, the positive and negatives for different options. I hope that answers your question. If I may add to that as well, I'd just like to say gray infrastructure, seawalls, high structures like these, they are immediate. So if you have a uh, coastline that needs immediate protection, um, similar to how we had our airport that needed, we could not afford to have our airport down for 24 hours anymore. So the, the rocks are effective against, you know, um, five, 10 foot seas, that sort of thing, so it's immediate, it's right there. Um, however, it's the green infrastructure is slower. So mangroves, um, sand unit ecosystems, the older they get, the more resilient they are, and they are also more elastic where they can respond to a storm event. But that is why I think it's important to have a combination of the two. Um, and even though I am an ecologist, I, it's not that I don't believe in the gray infrastructure. The gray infrastructure is definitely necessary, especially in this time of sea level rise. But having the gray infrastructure alone um, puts us at a disadvantage because the green infrastructure actually helps us to be more elastic, more resilient over time. It's a living area. It, um, it um, reduces our carbon footprints. It, it's almost like it negates the concrete a little bit and there it promotes biodiversity. So there's a lot of um, pros and cons for both or, or all three. Um, if you, you can look at mangroves as both green and blue because mangroves often have you know, water um, sitting in the area. So it's, it's, it's important to have a combination of all three, especially in modern times, if possible. However, budget can be very restrictive. I can think about, um, I, I use this same um, policy as Kingston example for so many reasons. Um, it had a sand dune component where they put the rocks in. Rocks are very unsightly, but 
the budget to actually put vegetation, sand dune vegetation back onto those rocks was, was tremendous. And most of our um, infrastructure projects like these are based on loans. So it would not be budgeted for the sand. The sand is sitting just on the outside of the rock. So maybe in a storm event, the sand will eventually be washed into the, the rock crevices and eventually we'll get the creepers. That succession may happen, but the country never simply, the government simply never had the budget to put the green with that gray. Uh, maybe it will happen over time, but let's see. But um, um, Betsy made a very important point about budget as well. And um, sometimes it's a little bit of political will too. Um, as I said, um, not to rag on the engineers too much, but I think we need to develop or have some kind of system where our engineering has to be um, a little bit so more sustainable because um, somebody who trains in concrete believes in concrete, right? So the reality is if, if, the, if the projects are conceptualized from the start with some green in it, I think um, it, it will go over better with everybody. But it's a matter of gray versus green, then gray, gray alone is gonna be cheaper for the short term. Thank you. Well, I think that's an excellent point, uh, Camila, that uh, it doesn't have to be a binary choice. It's frequently, if we look at the best solutions in different areas, it may be a combination of the two. And I can think of one particular criterion, which adding a, a green element is, is far more than just aesthetics or just in the future is that in many, many seawalls are highly reflective. And you know you you don't you don't get rid of the wave energy with a seawall, and um, be, it just bounces it's elsewhere in your basin. If it, and these can just cause problems elsewhere and, and cause erosion problems on other you know in other parts of your system. So in order to reduce more of the energy or more of the wave energy, that the great you know mangroves or or some, something like that can certainly take, you know, dissipate a lot more of the energy there. So that actually provides a hydrodynamic benefit as well. So that's another example. But I think it's really, a, in a lot of cases, it's how can we work these together for the aesthetics, for the hydrodynamics, for the resiliency aspects of it. Thanks. So, um, yeah, there's a, another couple of questions in the chat, so we'll fire away. Uh, this, this is, uh, unless somebody else has anything to say on this, this particular point. Um, there was a question for you, uh, uh, Camilo, from uh, Kevin Young. Kevin, do you want to ask that, or you want me to? Uh, sure, sure. I'll I'll ask. Um, good good afternoon, panelists. Thank you for being here and and for this informative presentation. I, my question was for Camilo. Just wondering what parts of the island. Um, are have the you know contain the most mangrove reserves and are therefore the, on the most threatened for in terms of development future development can you say which 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 areas are rich in mangroves still are still left well the south coast of jamaica has um a lot more mangrove um resources than the north coast however the south yeah. coast is a it has a shallower continental shelf it's not as attractive to the tourism developments. It has some yeah. attention from other kind of industries, but for now and for the most part, it's it's not very attractive to development. So it's kind of conserved. Kind of safe. Right. Safe, um, safe and, um, yeah. um, well, recently we had a, a, a lot of interest in terms of a, a transshipment development. Um, the South Coast, um, Goat Islands, but um, um, just to show the, the growth of Jamaica, the, it was the citizens of Jamaica who resisted that development. Um, so that was resisted. And um, so far, the NGOs and so on on the South Coast seem to be keeping a pretty good handle on that. And um, my own personal research has shown that when there is an environmental group or a vested stakeholder in an area, then that area often tends to get a little bit more protection, um, especially when it comes to the, the public um, sphere of it. Um, so if something arises, then that environmental NGO will raise a red flag and um, rally up the troops, so to speak. 
However, the North Coast, um, surprisingly, has a fair amount of mangrove resources, um, but a lot of this has already been replaced. Um, so if you think about some of our tourism areas like uh, Montego Bay, some parts on the grill, yeah. et cetera. Um, so that's under a lot of developmental pressure, um, especially Trelawney. So Trelawney, um, for, for my overseas um, panelists and, and attendees here, Trelawney is that parish which is between Ocho Rios, one of our popular tourism spots, and Montego Bay, where the airport is. So over the last decade, that has received a whole lot of tourism interest. And I think Trelawney alone, that parish has lost about 300 hectares of mangroves in five years, uh, mostly yeah. to hotel development. So that is the area that is in real threat right now. Um, many of the other areas on the North Coast, like Montego Bay, don't have a lot of mangroves left. And I know the environmental agencies are really trying to protect that. But as I said earlier, getting these privately owned lands under government control, I think will be a very big part in challenging the, the whole developmental pressure for the North, Co North Coast. Um, right now, I'm actually, the, well, not me, the University of West Indies, we are working alongside with um, our National Environment and Planning Agency and a private landowner, which unlike most of the private landowners that have um, coastal lands, is actually very interested to see her 50 acres um, zone for conservation. So we're working on that right now. Um, so I hope I did answer your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah you did. Thank you. Yeah. South Coast has a lot more resources, but it's not under that much threat versus the North Coast that has a lot of white sand, a lot of um, coral reefs, and a lot of mangroves sitting on that white sand. So it's, it's like prime real estate, and it's seen as an enemy. So um, that, that's our situation right now. Got you. Thanks. Some things are the same throughout the throughout the basin, right? Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks, Camille. Uh, that was really informative. Uh, there's another question in the chat from Lauren Riley. Uh, if you would like to ask your question, Lauren. Yeah, sure. Um, I just want to say thanks for hosting and thanks all the panelists for being here. Oh, you're okay. Yeah, we've been hearing all about all these uh, amazing Lauren, your, your mic is, is sounding terrible. I think I might actually read your, <laughs> read your question for you, if you don't mind. So uh, uh, nature-based solutions, Lauren asked, and I apologize for cutting you off, but it was, it was very, very uh, messed up. NBS offer, uh, nature-based solutions offer an incredible range of in social, environmental, and economic benefits and great infrastructure as a time and place, but how can we incentivize greater use of green infrastructure overall? Uh, Rod, I think that might be a good one for yeah. you. Yeah, sure, I'll take that, take a shot. Yeah, I think uh, it's a great comment, you know, that they really do offer quite a range of benefits. Um, incentivizing is, is not easy. I think there's probably like two things when I think about for, for really kind of scaling this work. Um, the first one is really, and I talked about it a little bit, it was really, it's really kind of demonstrating the benefits of nature-based, right? As opposed to a seawall or a riprap or some sort of, you know, hard infrastructure. So I think to the extent that we can really quantify those benefits and it becomes sort of a, a go-to solution um, for folks that are looking at these options, I, I think that's really critical. So that return on investment. We did a study in the Gulf Coast that looked at sort of nature-based solutions as well as sort of this hard infrastructure. And, and we looked at that return on investment. We found that Things like um, you know uh, wetlands, you know large scale wetland restoration, either oyster reefs, um, marsh grass, those things have a really big return on investment, and they tend to pay out. For every dollar invested, you get about seven or eight dollars back, in sort of that flood protection benefit. Um, Grain infrastructure can be really effective, right? You know, like levees, um, you know, even elevating homes, things like that. But they're super expensive; and they don't pay back, and they you know they kind of pay back sometimes less than what you invest in them. So. You know, it's uh, probably that hybrid approach is, is really critical, but we see that that really strong return on investment. And then I think the second point is sort of the permitting of these kinds of projects. And it's not that easy to permit these. And I think a lot of folks have found them somewhat challenging and um, sometimes they are prohibited depending if you're an aquatic preserve. And so there's all sorts of issues with that. And so I think to the extent that we can streamline permitting to really allow these projects to go forward more easily, um, I think would be would really help get a lot more of these projects on the ground. In fact, at, at TNC, we've put together a, a committee, essentially an ad hoc committee that's kind of statewide that's looking at these permitting recommendations. And so we think by streamlining these things, you know, for green infrastructure, it can really get these, these projects 
um, to scale. And the first thing we're working on is really um, post storm event kind of uh, work, right? So for it's like your seawall fails, it's really easy to go back and put a seawall in, but it's not so easy to put a living shoreline in. So we're kind of working on that angle, and that aspect of this. And we've got experts around the state um, working on this. And actually it was the Southeast Compact, the Regional Climate Compact that urged us to kind of take this on. Um, so it's pretty exciting and we hope that, you know, this will really help kind of scale the work. Great. Uh, Betsy, I, I, don't, I thought I saw you looking like you might want to say something there. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but uh, do you have I can add to it. I think, I think Rod, um, I, I was agreeing with Rod with the permitting. I think that has, is, we're seen as the largest challenge. Um, you know, it's difficult to convince um, your superiors that we need to go with green infrastructure when those projects can take longer and cost more money. So I think, you know, the more projects that we can um, get going and that have gotten permitted, we'll be able to use that as a template to um, help other projects move forward at a faster manner. We need green infrastructure projects to be as easy as permitting gray infrastructure. When we get to that point, it's going to be a no brainer because I do believe that the community wants that. Um, but there's a lot of barriers. And I think that's uh, one of the you know, reasons that we love working with TNC as well as uh, the compact through their shoreline resilient group is that there are smart people working on this issue and what and understanding, you know, what, what do we need to do to kind of shift and make shifts um, in the way that we're thinking about this. And I know that Camilo mentioned it earlier, a, a bit it too is retraining our engineers um, to be thinking about green infrastructure. And I think that is something that is, is imperative as we move to the future. It can't just be about concrete and pipes. Well, I, I know we have, I see we have some engineers in the group here. Does anybody want to uh, comment on the future directions in your profession that uh, might be coming up? Okay. Uh, in the charge to the group, which uh, Sonia mentioned, uh, and off you take up the, the time there. No, I mean, I just, I mean, because you called us out, I have to step in. So I have to say that, I mean, the idea there is, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge for everyone. And I think the, the pathway there is through engineering, through working with everyone else. I think uh, having partners there that are our community partners, having basically the right organizations and the right projects there. I think it's very important to go from the laboratory setting to the pilot projects. Like that's why I applaud uh, Miami Beach. That's why working with TNC, working with the different let's say uh, local stakeholders uh, is, uh, is a key, but it's also about learning. Like we go out of our, uh, I would say, uh, uh, comfort zone there. So that's uh, another component there. We are, I mean, our curriculum has been based on very, I would say, uh, certain things, but as I learned some things, especially when you go green and gray or green uh, are not so certain. You have to evaluate them on the field. You have to, uh, there's a lot of uh, parameters there. So there is a lot to be said and, to learn about this, but uh, definitely I, I can see there is momentum there. And uh, I mean, there's a, uh, an entire group of us who are here and are working with you guys and learning from you. And that's, I think the most important part. I completely agree. And I didn't mean to, to give a knock to engineers. I, I think, you know, one of the, the things that makes me most excited about working with UM is um, your interdisciplinary approach. Um, you know, for those on the call who do not know, we have a very exciting project that we're working on um, with um, the ULINK team from UM and um, Professor House, as well as uh, Landolf and uh, Sonia from Architecture are all on the team. And the goal of this project is to um, study the use of artificial reef structures offshore that are transplanted with corals and understanding how the design can attenuate wave energy while at the same time as bringing back habitat um, to an area that it has been denuded of those resources. So, you know, that's exciting. And, and, and you know, Miami Beach sees itself as a living laboratory where we can um, explore these options. And, you know, for example, with that project, you know, I, I think it will be successful. And when it is, these could be installed throughout uh, Miami-Dade County and up the coast of Florida. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Um, and uh, thank you, Andal. Uh, the, uh, in the call before our session, Sonia um, Chow said that we would be exploring the question of funding. So to not have her be uh, called a, say she misrepresented it, I think we should uh, discuss that question. I mean, does any, how, how are we going to have these projects been funded or how do we look forward to having ways, mechanisms to fund them in the future? Camilo had mentioned that they're, they're mostly relying on loans to do this type of financing or do this type of, of um, construction. And I was wondering if there were other types of approaches that could be used um, or ideas regarding that. Anybody, uh, Rod, would you like to? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, so yeah, that's a big issue. It's like, right, how do, you, how do you fund these projects? I know, you know, there's that resilience bill that's out. Um, I think it's got a lot of traction. I don't know if it was a, maybe getting approved today. I haven't following it with the legislature, but you know, but, so th there's potentially a lot more money coming, but that's always the issue, you know, and that resilience bill has identified a hundred million dollars, right, for the state of Florida. And so, you know, a hundred million across all the counties and municipalities, right, it, it, it potentially get divvied up. So it's not going to be enough and we know. And so we've looked at a, a couple of different financing mechanisms and I'll, I'll just talk about one. Um, and it's really kind of like an insurance product. It's, it's basically, you know, can you insure a natural asset? And um, the answer is yes, you can. And so we actually, we piloted this in, in Cancun or just south of Cancun in Mexico. And so you best essentially can take out an insurance policy on your, your coral reef or whatever natural asset. Um, the idea is that that coral reef provides a lot of protection, right? To, to people and places and, and your beaches. And, and in Cancun, they know that um, without their beaches, you know, there's not going to be good tourism. And so, and they know that the reefs provide that, that protective value to their beaches and their hotels. And so um, the concept is you can take out a parametric policy. And for, for folks who don't know the parametric term, it's basically, um, it pays out on a trigger. So in this case, if it's a category, you know, certain category hurricane, you could actually pay out um, in terms of the policy and you use that money to actually go in and repair the reef. And so if you have a more resilient reef system, right, it provides that much more protection. So if you go in, you can upright corals, reattach corals, so on, um, that reef rebounds more quickly and provides that, that level of protection. So it's an interesting way, you know, to, to actually fund that work. And so um, Mexico has had that, that policy in place for two years and there was actually just a payout. It was Hurricane Delta in, 20, in uh, I think it was October of, of 2020, that kind of hit that trigger and it paid out, I think about 40% of the policy. So, you know, if you had a category five, it would pay out hundred percent. If it's category one, it might be like 20 or 30%. And so it paid out at about 40%, which is equaled about $850,000 in US dollars. And so they're able to actually go and do kind of triage and do repairs on the reef. So it's a really kind of innovative way um, to add a layer of sort of finance and, you know, funding to your, your, your natural system. And so we did a feasibility study in Florida and Hawaii to see if it would, it would work here. And we found that it, it could work. Um, you could actually purchase a policy. Anybody who has an interest in the, in the reef system could, could purchase the policy. Um, and we, we found out that it would cost you about, um, I think about 10% of your payout. So if you wanted a million dollar payout, it would cost you about a hundred thousand um, dollars to do. And so, it could be cost effective in, in, in some cases. So Betsy, we'd have to talk, maybe that could work for your artificial reef system. Um, I think it, it has, has a lot of um, potential you know, value. And so we think it's so interesting, we're actually looking at mangrove insurance because we know that in Florida, like we talked about mangroves provide a lot of protection in Florida. Um, if a storm were to occur and there were damage to the mangroves, you know, if you were able to go back and do a restoration fairly quickly, um, you bring back that resilience benefit to the community. And so we're actually just kicked off a new project to explore that. So I think it's kind of an exciting way to kind of bridge this with in the insurance sector and reinsurance. And they're the, really the ones mostly interested in funding this work. Um, so I think they really see the value in sort of these natural systems, um, you know, really paying back sort of in these resilience dividends almost. But uh, I think it's, it's a, a, we have to look at sort of this layered approach, right? Because there's, there's not going to be a silver bullet in how to fund this work. And I think this is one way to do that. Um, and there's lots of other ways, you know, whether it's a geo bonds or resilience bonds or other trusts. Um, I think we have to look at, you know, many layers of, of how you fund this work. Uh, thank you. Do uh, any of the other panelists want to chime in? Yeah. Betsy, Camilo, do you have anything on that? I 
think it's hard to go after that fantastic response. Um, it's, it's so, you know, with the city, I think a piece of it is looking, um, and, and this is not as sexy as uh, working with the reinsurance and insurance companies, but it's looking at the budget and uh, looking for co-benefits. So, you know, we already have money to uh, improve our seawalls. So making the case that a portion of those funds should be used toward uh, a more living shoreline approach and then doing, you know, the assessments necessary, um, I think, one of the benefits of grant funding is it allows us to uh, get our toes wet in that space and show that this has value. And once elected officials see that, they're more willing to fund future projects. So it's just you know building that momentum uh, over time, looking at the existing budgets that you have and being creative. Um, and you know those are some simple ways to you know to, to think about that funding piece. Also, another thing which this ties into green infrastructure, but again, we're just starting. Um, my team has been working to uh, develop ordinances which include um, funds. So for example, we just passed um, a fertilizer ordinance in January and uh, key language that we included was the establishment of uh, the Miami Beach Biscayne Bay uh, Protection Fund. And so any violations of that ordinance are going to be deposited into this fund. And over time, that uh, fund is going to grow and then that's going to allow us to invest back into uh, projects and programs that protect the Bay. Uh, right now, we're also working on um, a slew of um, ordinances specifically related to water quality. Um, and then the idea would be that any fines from, from those um, will go also go into this fund. And, and those ordinances are, are targeting specifically our construction um, that's going on to making sure that they're not polluting, um, as well as uh, restaurants and hotels um, that have grease traps. So, you know, it's, it's being creative of where you can develop and, and build funds and, um, you know, kind of keeping, keeping an open mind to it, you know, it, you have to be creative. And so, um, you know, be it you're on the public side or the private side, uh, finding those spaces to, to be creative in that fashion. Okay, I'll just add a little bit as well. And um, yeah, Betsy is quite right. Um, after Rod's, uh, Rod's narrative, it's very, very hard to be as impressive as that parametric insurance. So we're not quite there in terms of parametric insurance in terms of mangrove ecosystems in Jamaica or reefs just yet, but um, give it time. And um, I think what we have been looking at mostly in Jamaica, not some of it isn't as appealing though, it's just a matter of the reality. So we spoke about developmental pressure, especially on the North Coast. So what happens oftentimes is that a developer, um, if he's willing to pay the price, can develop, let's say, 10 acres of mangroves. And that goes into, uh, lack of a better word, a mitigation fund um, for the government. Um, or they have to um, restore an area, um, which may be offsite. So sometimes some areas that are critical may benefit from this kind of mit mitigation um, input. So this is um, what the NEPA calls a no net loss policy. So it does work to benefit some areas, even though you are losing um, a coastal ecosystem elsewhere, but that coastal ecosystem is theoretically replaced by a hotel or some other development. So they take the risk and they become the seawall for that um, community behind them. Um, another thing is grants. We do um, apply for a fair amount of grants, international grants. And I know, for example, the TNC is working in Jamaica on a number of grants. Uh, we have other local um, funding agencies as well, like we have one called the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica Forest Conservation Fund, which um, has funded a lot of my research over the years. Um, and we are also getting into some blue carbon um, resilience credits. Uh, we are slated to do our first one on the south coast of Jamaica. So I remember Kevin's question about um, um, protecting mangroves around Jamaica. So down in um, Rocky Point area, um, there's an agency called Sodico that has gotten some a blue carbon restoration project. I believe it's about 2,000 hectares. The, the, the thing with these projects is that they want large areas. Um, 
as um, credits for their credits. So for example, that 50 acre mangrove on the North Coast may not qualify. They may not be interested in that small area. So, and for a country with less than 10,000 hectares, it's, it's kind of hard to find um, areas that you can work on for that. This particular area is actually, was actually affected by um, the sugarcane industry essentially turned off the water after the sugarcane industry kind of had a decline and there's some amount of saline intrusions. It's a very interesting project and it will be our largest mangrove restoration project in Jamaica. And we're very happy to have worked on, on the initial planning stages of that. So these are just some of the different um, ways in which this work is financed in Jamaica currently. Well, thank you all. Um, and uh, this looks like we're close, coming to a close on the time here. And uh, I thank the, I'd like to thank the panelists for the Camilo Trench, Elizabeth Wheaton, and Rob Brown for your very uh, thoughtful and insightful uh, information you provided today. And I'd like to thank all the attendees. It's been a very, uh, some good questions and we uh, really appreciate the, uh, the discussion. And um, yeah, so thank you all. I understand that there's the plenary after this with uh, our president of the University of Miami, Julio Frank and um, that will be uh, commencing shortly. So I'll give you time to get a cup of coffee or whatever you need before the, the plenary. And uh, thank you all for joining this session. It was a pleasure.